Chapter 7 Surrender The next day there was no mention of the hypnotist. There were no jokes told by snickering students in the hallways about how silly they had looked on stage, dancing and singing. There was no backslapping and raucous appreciation of the entertainment value they had provided. Nothing. When they saw each other in the hallway, Raj, Mei Ling, Emily, and Solomon turned the other way, secretly afraid that making eye contact would confirm the truth of the experience they each hoped was an illusion. During the week that followed, Mei Ling's eyes hugged the floor as she walked through the hallways. More than usual, she was afraid to face people, especially with the humiliation of what she may have done on stage under hypnosis. Raj, on the other hand, held his head high as he walked down the hallway, proud that he had been chosen to be on the stage. Emily was confused about what had happened and decided to go on as usual, keeping busy with volleyball practice and spending time with friends. Solomon watched people closely, wondering what illusions they had seen him do on stage. But as the week progressed, he slid into his daily routine and tried to forget about the hypnotist. He couldn't. After a week, Solomon decided it was definitely odd that no one had said anything about Dr. Ravana's session. Standing at the lockers one day, he turned to Shane and in as nonchalant a tone as possible asked, so what did you think about that hypnotist last week? What hypnotist? Shane asked as he rummaged through his locker to find his math textbook. Man, I'm late again, he mumbled, looking up at the hall clock. He slammed the locker door shut and began rushing down the hall. I don't know what you're talking about, he said over his shoulder. The hypnotist comes at the end of the year when we're ready to let loose a bit. Solomon sent a message to the group. Guys, we have to meet. Nobody else saw the hypnotist. There was no hypnotist. Ask around if you don't believe me. Raj's response was immediate. Why? There's nothing to talk about. It'll all blow over. We just have to leave it. Nothing to talk about, said Solom. Solomon. Watch the news and see for yourself. Solomon watched as Raj's icon disappeared on the screen. Then he tried to reach Emily and Mei Ling by text. Emily was in the change room after volleyball practice. Beth, Amelia, and Laura were laughing as they stood in a row in front of the big mirrors, brushing their hair and putting on their makeup. Emily's movements were slow and thoughtful. She had something on her mind. Unsure of how to start, she decided to be blunt. Did a hypnotist come to the school last week, she asked. What do you mean, asked Beth. She momentarily stopped applying mascara to look at Emily. Did we have a hypnotist come to the school, you know, and do a show? Emily was starting to get worried about what they might say. Amelia looked at Emily, her face a beautiful blend of light chocolate-colored skin from her Antiguan mother and fine features from her Thai father. Usually the hypnotist comes at the end of the year. Only the grade 12 class is allowed on stage, though. It's kind of like their last hurrah, added Beth, and it's great for the rest of us to see because it takes them off their thrones. Oh my God, thought Emily. Now she was really confused. What's wrong, Em? Laura's Nordic blonde hair swung as she turned to look at Emily. Nothing, said Emily. I can hardly wait to see it. Raj tried to ignore Solomon's message, but it became increasingly difficult to do so. He saw a copy of the Times of India on his uncle's desk. The cover story was about a growing swell of anti-corruption sentiment that was sweeping the country. Regular citizens were demanding that the government punish corrupt businesses. Raj feared his father might be targeted. The next day, there was a severe earthquake in a remote part of India and the embassy in Beijing was bombarded with urgent demands for information about loved ones. His uncle didn't return home for dinner the rest of the week. There was an unexpected meteor shower over Russia, another deadly car bomb in the Middle East, and a major stock market crash. Is the world falling apart in a spectacular way this week, or am I just being sensitive, he wondered. 
Then the school was suddenly closed down after the foreign media reported the beginning of a possible global pandemic in China. All the downtown shops and restaurants in Beijing were closed as people stayed home, afraid to interact with others. Those people still in the streets wore masks to cover their faces and schools stayed closed until they would ascertain the severity of the virus. When they finally returned to school, students were made to stand in lines in the parking lot as teachers, their faces covered with masks, applied antiseptic gel to the students' hands. Raj was not about to stand in line with all the other students and expose himself to possible infection. He waited comfortably in the back seat of the limousine as long as possible. Maybe Solomon is right, he thought grudgingly as he finally pulled on his face mask and opened the limo door to join the line. Chapter 8 Commitment Later that day, Solomon received a text from Raj saying he would consider the possibility of meeting them but was only free Thursdays after school. So two days later, Raj, Mei Ling, Emily and Solomon met in the library near the dictionaries where they had first met Ravana. Emily arrived first thinking she would use the waiting time to catch up on a reading assignment. Within minutes, the others arrived. The collar on Raja's shirt was as stiff as the look on his face as he sat across from her. Either we're in an illusion or the whole school is, said Raj. Both are pretty hard to believe. We must have been hypnotized and led to the library, said Solomon, but no one remembers a hypnotist even being here. Is it possible this is a shared illusion? asked Emily. According to Raj, we all read the, read the same book and we're the only ones who seem to know about the hypnotist. Maybe there was a subliminal message in the book that affected our subconscious and Ravana took advantage of it. I think not knowing is the best reason to find out what's happening. What do we have to lose? Solomon asked. I agree, said Mei Ling quietly. Why would we accept an assignment from someone who doesn't exist? Asked Raj. Solomon looked at him. Have you seen what's happening in the world? These past couple of weeks would be pretty good evidence that Dr. Ravana is right about the world being on the path to destruction. Well, just because it was a bad few weeks doesn't mean she's real, contested Raj. So you're hallucinating now? Emily frowned at him. Maybe it is true and everything will just keep getting worse until we do something, suggested Mei Ling, looking up from behind her thick black bangs. Emily smiled at Mei Ling. Maybe we should at least give it a try and see what happens. She paused. What were the instructions again? She said we had to find seven secrets and understand them, Solomon said. She must be referring to the seven secrets of the universe from the New Beginnings book, don't you think? He looked at Raj, who sat in stony silence. Yeah, that makes sense, said Emily, and we have to find them somewhere between the worlds, whatever that means. If we were going to do this, where would we even start, asked Raj, not wanting to spend more time than necessary with these people. Good question. Mei Ling took Raj's inquiry as commitment. Sorry, but I have to go meet my sister now, said Emily, gathering up her things. Let's meet here next Thursday and figure it out. Someone should bring the book. I will, said Solomon. Chapter 9. The Jewel of Eternal Life The school was quiet and the hallways deserted when Solomon arrived in the library and sat quietly to wait for the others. Emily arrived minutes later. Did you bring the book? I tried to find it, he said. I even asked Miss Jessam for help. She looked through the database, but it wasn't there. The weird thing is, she said she'd never heard of it before. Whoa, that is weird, said Emily. Mei Ling arrived in time to hear the last bit of their conversation. That means we only have Dr. Ravana's instructions to help us, she said, as she sat in the chair closest to Emily. She noticed that Emily and Solomon interacted with the ease of people who had known each other for years. She felt excluded, as usual. Something's very wrong if Ms. Jessam doesn't know about the book, said Raj, joining them in the circle of chairs. 
He had been lingering, listening to their conversation and remembering his extended interaction with the librarian. He hung the long strap of his book bag over the back of a chair and sat crossing his arms and legs tightly in front of him, a statement of disinterest. Oh well, I guess we just have to try to recall what Dr. Ravana said and see if that works, said Emily. Raj mimicked Dr. Ravana's steely, dominating voice. Now breathe and relax. No, I mean it. Seriously, Raj, we should do it properly. Emily found his prim aloofness irritating. Okay, let's piece together what we can recall. Mei Ling, what do you remember? Solomon asked. Mei Ling's voice trembled as she spoke. I remember she, she told us to relax and imagine a room in our heads. She looked at Solomon as if he was the only one who could be trusted to listen. Let's get this over with, Raj interjected, pressing his hands to his knees as if to leap forward. I'll start. Solomon stiffened, resisting Raj's dominance. Emily shrugged and turned to Mei Ling, who had already closed her eyes in cooperation. Raj spoke slowly, imitating Dr. Ravana's voice and commanding nature. After a couple of minutes, Emily said, this isn't working. I can hear everyone breathe, and Raj, your voice isn't very relaxing. Maybe we could try walking and see if it helps us concentrate a bit better, said Solomon. But that's not how Dr. Ravana did it on stage, said Raj impatiently. I know, but maybe it'll be easier to concentrate if we move a bit. We can walk slowly like we're looking for something, Solomon persisted. Fine, Raj said through pursed lips. They stood and began walking slowly, each starting at the end of a separate aisle, converging at the dictionary stand. During the first attempt, Mei Ling began to giggle, which provoked Emily's laughter. Raj insisted angrily that they start again. During the second attempt, Raj stumbled when his foot caught the lower edge of a bookshelf. He stopped himself from falling, but the atmosphere of concentration was broken when they heard him curse under his breath. Finally, Emily said, how will we be able to save the world if we can't even get this right? It's impossible to get four people to concentrate on anything at the same time. Maybe we should just sit down and see if we can relax again, Mei Ling offered. Then we can try to see the screen in our minds and wait the way we did on stage. Once they were settled, Mei Ling said, what if we're trying to arrive at a state of mind and not at a place? Raj turned to look at her as if noticing her for the first time. You're right, Mei Ling, we need to create a state of mind, he said, a hint of respect in his voice. Why don't you lead us? Pleased to be asked, Mei Ling gave it her best effort. Her quiet voice reminded them to breathe, relax, focus inwards on the screen in their minds. There was a palpable change in the atmosphere as they began to relax. Emily felt her thoughts slowing down. Mei Ling felt a little ball of power in the center of her forehead. Solomon noticed that his vision was blurred and soft around the edges. Raj was quiet. In the silence that followed, each was completely absorbed in their own experience, unaware of the other's presence. Suddenly the scene changed and they were in a misty place. The sky overhead was dark. A black cloud had completely covered the sun, which could be seen only as a dull glow. The heavy sky shone with an unnatural metallic glare. Everything around them was blurry, as if they were standing in thick fog. Emily could see the others' bodies as dark blobs surrounded in mist. There was no sound here. It was dead silent. Emily stretched her hands out in front of her and could see their outline as she wiggled her fingers, touching her thumbs to her index fingers. There was no sensation in her hands. She couldn't feel anything. It was as if her senses had been muted. She could see the faint outline of a head. Then she heard Solomon's hopeful voice. We aren't in the library. His face came into focus and Emily could see that his lips weren't moving as he spoke. We did it. Your lips aren't moving, thought Emily, but I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you too, Mei Ling added. 
her thoughts reverberating in their minds. There was the faint outline of something stretching across the area in front of them, was barely visible through the thick mist. What is that? asked Solomon. The mist parted slightly, as if in direct response to his wish to see more clearly. Stretching across the horizon, as far as their eyes could see, was a wall. It must have been made of glass or something transparent, because they could see through to the other side, where a field stretched into the distance. The sun shone brightly, and the field was covered with sparkling objects that glittered in the sun like dewdrops. Their sparkle spread misty rainbows of light in all directions. Emily walked toward the wall. The others were close behind her. It's beautiful, thought Mei Ling, as she looked through the glass. Emily squinted, trying to see the objects more clearly. There was a collective gasp as they realized simultaneously that the field was full of diamonds. Unbelievable, Raj exclaimed. Solomon stood perfectly still, his feet planted to the ground as if they had taken root there. His eyes were wide, his mouth was partly open, and the look on his face was distant. I love it here. It's so peaceful, he said. I've never felt so calm. I don't want to leave. His mind was trance-like, slow and saturated with silence. I like it too, Mei Ling responded. I feel as if my thoughts have almost stopped. It's like we're in a slow motion movie, Raj observed. Emily stared across the diamond field in front of her. She felt drawn to touch the wall. Gingerly, she reached out her hand and watched as it went through to the other side, disappearing as it crossed. The others could feel her surprise, but they couldn't feel any fear from her. Before anyone could say anything, Emily walked through the wall. As soon as she crossed to the other side, her body collapsed to the ground where the others were standing. Mei Ling reached down to touch her body. It was completely limp and inanimate. Through the glass wall, they could see a diamond hovering in the air where Emily's head would have been. Emily? Mei Ling reached her hand across the glass. Wait, Mei Ling, don't do anything stupid, shouted Raj. But even his distress was buffered by the silent stillness of the place. The mists of light whirled through their thoughts, softening them. Mei Ling retracted her hand. I think that diamond must be Emily, Solomon stated. Guys, they could hear Emily's thoughts and feel her presence. Where are you? asked Solomon. I'm over here. Emily's thoughts were coming from the floating diamond. But how are you talking? asked Solomon. It's amazing that we know it's Emily, even though her body isn't working, said Mei Ling. Looks dead, said Raj, contemplating Emily's body. Maybe that's the illusion, Mei Ling said. She appears dead, but she's not. Solomon walked up to the wall next to the place where Emily's body lay on the ground. It looks like a costume someone took off in a hurry and threw on the floor between acts and a play, he said. He passed his hand through the wall and watched as it disappeared. On one side of the wall was the physical world, and on the other side was a world that appeared to operate according to different laws. He walked through the wall and the others watched as his body dropped to the ground next to Emily's. A second diamond appeared, hovering next to the one they knew to be Emily. It's like flying, Solomon said. There's no weight to drag you down. Raj and Mei Ling could hear his thoughts just as clearly as before. Yes, said Emily, it's like floating in a pool. It's very relaxing. Raj and Mei Ling looked at each other, curious. Together they crossed the, through the wall, leaving their bodies lying next to the others. Hovering above the field of diamonds, they sensed that the diamonds beneath them were alive with personalities. Suddenly, in a swirl of light, the other diamonds began to rise. 
Slowly at first, then in one synchronized movement, they formed a giant constellation of stars spiraling upwards. The diamond cluster hovered for a moment, illuminating the field below. Emily experienced a magnetic pull toward them, but willed herself to stay with the others. Still in their diamond form, Emily, Solomon, Mailing, and Raj watched as the swarm of diamonds disappeared, leaving them behind. They remain in the field, aware of their bodies on the other side of the wall. I don't get it. Raj watched his words appear on the computer screen as he typed. He was sitting at his desk in the apartment complex in downtown Beijing. He had just arrived home from school and the experience in the diamond field. From his room, the skyline was barely visible due to the thick cloud of smog that hung over the city. He thought the air of Delhi was dirty, but the air of Beijing was even cloudier. The shape of the skyline changed every day as new buildings sprang up. Most of the new buildings were uninspiring to look at, square, brown, and stone, built for functional purposes, not for beauty. As he stared out the window, Raj found himself longing for the color and chaos of India, with its temples and deities covered with flower garlands. He was surprised to be missing India. He had been so keen to leave, but now its vibrancy seemed appealing. Auntie had invited him to the temple this evening, but he had asked to stay at home. He discovered very quickly that living with Auntie and Uncle was much the same as living with his parents. Just this morning, as he sat in prayer with them, his uncle's cell phone rang, prompting Auntie to deliver the same scalding look his mother often gave his father. Raj had to leave early for school and hoped he wouldn't receive the same disapproving look for cutting his prayer time short. He blinked when he heard the beep of a new message and turned from the window to see that Emily and Solomon were online. I don't get it either, typed Emily, but I have to say, that was the coolest experience I've ever had. No kidding, wrote Solomon, but I wasn't expecting the first secret to lead us to death. If that's what death is like, it wasn't so bad. But we didn't die, typed Raj. Seems there's more to us than our bodies, said Emily. I figure the diamond must be our spirit, you know, the jewel of eternal life from the first chapter of New Beginnings. And what? We stay like that forever, floating around and hearing each other think, typed Raj. It's funny. I remember the titles of the chapters in the book and some of the details, but I don't remember the book connecting all the ideas into a full story, Emily typed. Maybe that's what we have to figure out, said Solomon. I wonder if this is how it will go. We have a weird experience, then it's over, and then we have to understand it. Raj typed. Why isn't Mei Ling online? Solomon, she has extra tutoring. Her parents want her to get top marks. Emily, so do mine, but I still have free time. Raj, well, you're from Canada. Life's easier there. Standards aren't as high. Raj heard a knock at the door and typed. Dinner time, gotta go. Solomon responded, me too. See ya. My standards aren't lower than any other than other people's, Emily thought to herself. Raj was always acting so superior. It infuriated her. She switched on her desk lamp, and the light flashed off the silver pendant draped over the side of her monitor. She blinked, momentarily blinded. Later that night, Solomon found his mum hunched over the kitchen table, her head in her hands. She sat up quickly and smiled a weary smile when she heard him enter the room. Hey, Mom. Hello, dear. Her voice was heavy. Her eyes were red. and She looked tired. She had been working extra hours trying to settle into the new job. How's it going? He asked. It's a big change, she admitted. Things work in such a different way here. Sometimes I wonder if I will ever figure it out. Solomon thought for a moment. I guess school is school for us, he said. It's probably a bigger change for you. He knew he, she had sacrificed a lot for this move. Maybe it's culture shock, Mum. 
I mean, you probably have more contact with Chinese culture than we do. She stood up and straightened her skirt. I'll be okay. I don't want you to worry, Solomon. I will learn and it will be fine. It sounded like she was reassuring herself as much as him. She reached out to pat his hand. It's late. You should get ready for bed. Mom, can I ask you something? He hesitated, not wanting to add to her burden. She looked up at him expectantly, her smile encouraging him to continue. I know you've always believed in God, but have you ever thought about what the soul might be, you know, practically? What are you thinking, she asked, sensing he had something to say. Well, I just wonder if you think the soul could exist separate from the body, you know, like, like its own being. He realized he had never spoken to his mom about her beliefs. Although he and Ben had accompanied her to church on Sundays back in Addis, his interest was limited to the singing and quiet time. Now he was very curious to know what she thought. Yes, son. Yes, son. I think the soul is the spark of life that makes the body work. Why are you asking? I just wonder how knowing this would help. Help what? She asked. Well, help us deal with life. Hmm. Well, if we truly believed it, we'd be able to let go. We wouldn't hang on so tight to everything, including our bodies. What's got you interested in this? She asked again. No reason, he said, and gave her a hug. Thanks, Mom. Good night.